I want you to think about these quotes as we get into this lesson. Sidoni Gabriel Collette, who is a French author, journalist, actress, and she also participated as a mime with some different things, offered these words. She said, what a wonderful life I've had. I only wish I realized it sooner. And I think about those words. I think about how we have all been blessed in so many different ways, physically, spiritually. Truly, our lives are wonderful. Yes, there are bumps in the road. Yes, there are difficulties. And for some, unfortunately, we see the struggles that we deal with kind of outweigh sometimes what we see or what, what good we see in this world. And I want you to think with me, and you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 16, verses 25 down to verse 33. The question that we want to think about and examine this evening is why does life hurt? This question that I was asked was comes from a conversation that I had two years ago with one of my children who was in uh, elementary school at the time and was dealing with some difficulties. One of the things is, you know, bullying. We see it getting more and more prominent in schools and the effects that that has on kids. Something we just don't know. And we see the events that take place, suicide taking place. When I was working for uh, the Edison Schools in Ohio before we moved here, I was working there uh, as a substitute, working maintenance, and I worked with a lot of the high school, and I got to uh, get to know several people there and talk with the students because I was I was I was the six foot five security officer for a while during lunch. And uh, so I talked to the kids, walked from table to table, we talked. Had one, she was a straight A student, 4.23 GPA, so above and beyond expectations with her grades. Was a volunteer with the Humane Society in the local county. She had donated and volunteered so much time to what different types of charities they had in the area. In May of 2021, she took her life. And answers are still not there. And I dealt with some of the questions because some of the kids, some of the kids at school called me Preacher Dan because they knew that I worked as a preacher and they had different questions. They'd ask me during lunch. And some of the conversation came as well from this, as well. My daughter heard about the news and said, Why does life hurt? I want you to read with me tonight from John chapter 16, verses 25, down to verse 33 as we begin this lesson together. It says, These sayings I have spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things. And have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them. Do you now believe? Indeed the hour is coming. Yes has now come. That you will be scattered. Each to his own will leave me. Will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. You think about what's said there, especially in these last two verses. Jesus is building kind of a situation and building and teaching a lesson to them about loving God, about seeking and doing the Father's will, about the need for this, because some dark times, some, some very tough times are coming, speaking about what's going to happen to Jesus. The hour is coming when you're going to be scattered. These people have followed Jesus for a period of time, followed him in his ministry, and yet they were closer to that time of him being betrayed. And he said, you all are going to scatter. Now we see the response of, of Peter. Lord, I will not leave you. And he said, yes, Peter, even you will leave me. You're going to deny me three times. And he says in verse 33, is some words and reminders for us. He says, I've spoken to you these things. In the world, you will have tribulation. We will face difficulties. There are going to be tough times in our lives. There are going to be times where we feel a sense of lowness. But be of good cheer. And when we think about some of the things and the effects that, ha that we see, for example, in schools today, kids feel lonely. One of the top reasons when it comes to this bullying and what happens to the effects of this, why kids commit suicide is they feel like no one cares. <coughs> They feel like they are alone. I made it a goal, after, especially after those events there in May of 2021, when I was around the kids. I worked, at the, again, I worked at the high schools. I worked at all three schools. I worked we had a junior high or a middle school, I should say, and then we had an elementary school. And made it a point to be able to talk to the kids. Just to even just give some sort of presence, a hello. I said hello so many times to each and every kid that I saw during the day. It's some of those small things that can help make a difference, to kind of help, because we don't know what's going on entirely with kids, whether it's their home life, whether what's going on at school, whether what's going on outside of school, outside of the home. And we see that not only is it in kids, but it's in adults too. We face some sense of loneliness. The last couple of years that we have dealt with some of the different things is that we have seen an increase of loneliness or seclusion away from people with all the events that took place since 2020. We don't know what I'm talking about. But we have seen a great deal of loss and suffering, pain and su or suffering. And we've seen it kind of become more and more of the upswing in recent years. We've experienced losses in so many different ways. We talk about how the jobs have come and gone. People have lost their jobs, and I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing new, but we've seen an increase of it over the last few years, and hopefully kind of seen a little bit on the rebound. We've seen lives being lost, whether it was through that virus that came through or whether it's been through other things that have caused a death or natural cause, whatever it may be. We have seen an increase of lives being cut short. The economics of going on in our world, we have experienced a lot of different losses in so many different ways. We can talk about what's going on not only within our own country, but looking at things in the world. The wars that are going on, the civil unrest that is happening. We can talk about the current events that's happening over in the Middle East right now. I've had the question, is this the end? We've seen that continue to go on and on and on. Again, mentioning the physical illnesses and diseases that have been affecting so many different people and probably have been close to us from time to time. But not only physically have we seen the pain and suffering and losses, the mental effects that it has had, and I have spent some time talking with a therapist. I had some of my family going into therapy in recent months and recent years as well. 
the concerns that have led have been let out through all the different things that have happened. We always talk about the physical things, we can see those things, but the mental aspects have also taken a toll and effect on us. Jesus warned about tribulation, and it came in multiple ways. I want you to think about a few different examples with me. We're not going to read it, but if you think about what's over in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. Job chapter 1, chapter 2, we begin to get introduced to this man named Job, a well-known man, a man that we see had a lot of possessions, a very wealthy, well-off individual. But we think about the impacts and the losses that Job experienced. When you look at chapter 1, the losses that he, that he had were, well, he lost servants. They had one servant. Each time there was a servant that came, he delivers the news. And you know, all of your servants have been killed. I alone am here to tell you the news. And within those different servants that were spared, we read about the donkeys, the oxen, the sheep. The camels, all of them came back. Each, there were certain groups of individuals that came and raided, came and took over, and killed all the servants, and took all of these possessions. I alone am left to tell you of the news. That's not it, though, is it? In chapter 1, we read that last servant that came in. And said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking. They were in the house of the oldest brother. When the great wind came. And the house collapsed. And your children are dead. That's right. I'm alone left to tell you this news. We could say and stop right there and say. This, this man has dealt with a lot already and enough. <clears throat> but we see Satan had more within trying to cause this man to stop. We're going to talk more about it here in just a little bit about you. But in chapter 2, we see that his health was affected. That he had these boils all over his body. And how bad was it for Job? Broken pottery to scrape himself to get some sort of... That's what he was relying on. I haven't had boils. I've had, you know, they say some of the boils, sometimes if you deal with this, you can compare it slightly to when you get the, 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 the skin follicles kind of get infected in that way. This is just a minute comparison. You know, I've had a couple of those on my body before, and they hurt. It said from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, he had these painful boils. Imagine, you can't walk, really. You can't do very much. And he went and tried to get pottery broken into pieces to be able to relieve himself. But not only do we see that loss his wife, after seeing all these different things, what did she say? Curse God and die. Get relief this way. She had experienced all these losses as well. And was hurting as well from this. And we see the different response. We're going to talk about this as we look on here in just a little bit. Think about another example with me. We're going to read this together. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Beginning with verse 24. We have the Apostle Paul. We consider Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's look from verse 24 down to verse 28. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 down to verse 28. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning verse 24, says from the Jews... Five times I received 40 stripes minus one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils of unfalse brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things will come upon me daily. My deep concern for all the churches. Paul, we learn what happens to him. He faced some difficulties. He faced some hurt in this life. He was whipped. He was in prison. We talk about the, the, the different times of it, whether it was whipped or stoned or beaten with rods. I mean, you think about all these different things. He was shipwrecked multiple times. It says there that he was in multiple different types of peril, multiple types of troubles. And as we look at this, it says he was left vulnerable, sleepless, weariness, toil, hunger, cold, he was in, in nakedness. The idea of being vulnerable. That's what he was in. That's what he was facing when we talk about the difficulties of this life. I want you to consider another one. The Son of God. In Matthew 26 and 27, you can read the entire account of what happens to Jesus when he is betrayed by Judas. And we read on from there the events that take place. Where he was, he was tried. He was accused of, you name it. They were falsely accused him. He was scourged. The Romans had different methods of torture. Scourging was within itself a normal death sentence. Were they with him? But they didn't just use just any type of whip. They had something, whether it was beads, rocks, something to be able to dig into the skin on the end of each of these whips. And each time digging a little bit deeper and deeper and deeper into the flesh. Basically to the point when they scourge an individual, in most cases, they would just rot from disease, from being infected with what they were being whipped with. But Jesus was scourged. And it didn't stop there. Mocked. The verbal effects, the verbal attacks. For he was mocked. Here, here's the king of kings. But there one bowed down and put the reed on him, put the purple robe on, put the crown on him, twisted with thorns. There's the king. Again, he was beaten. Not only did he see scourge, but he was also beaten. And as we read there in this text from Matthew 26 and 27, what happens? He yielded his spirit. Death took place. He died. After all these, we could say Jesus faced a lot of difficulty, faced a lot of hurt, faced a lot of tribulation that he was warning his disciples about as well. Then you can consider the church in Smyrna. Again, I mentioned, uh, I believe I mentioned yesterday that a good friend of mine, John Hines, and I, we are doing a podcast, and right now we are discussing the church in Asia, Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. And we just finished this discussion in the last two weeks on the church in Smyrna. And you look at, at the time of when this is being written in Revelation 2. I'm going to read verse 10 in just a moment. You had, at one point prior to this, you had the Roman Emperor Nero, who was a notorious, creative is not the right word, but that's the word we want to use. He was creative in his ways to torture. And, and you know, you think about 
Boy, what, what he went through, if you read in history what Nero was involved in, think, boy, that was enough. That's an that evil man. And it was hold my, hold my beverage. Here's Domitian, who was even worse. One that killed his own family to seize power and to come up with even new ways to torture brethren. And in particular, one of those in line was the church in Smyrna, who's up there on that northern coast and kind of was the was the sitting duck for Roman seizures and different things at the time. So the other city, Smyrna was one that's going to face kind of the wrath first. In Roman or Revelation 2 and verse 10, if you'll turn there with me. Roman, Revelation, let's say Romans. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. It says here, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, do not fear any of the things that you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. You will have tribulation in ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. The way that they had tortured some of these cities is that at this time, Domitian was also focused on trying to basically commit genocide on Christianity and torturing them in any new way he could along with the old ways. And what happened was they would grab these Christians, pull them out of their homes, and destroy everything within their homes where they could not live in there, and then just left them out there on the, on the street to be homeless. They were going to be in prison, obviously. Look at this. Jesus warned, you're going to face some difficulty. You're going to face You're going to be in prison 10 days. Uh, is it literal or figurative? I don't know. Looking at this. They were going to face a life sentence in prison. It was not going to be a pleasant situation. Most likely, death was going to be coming soon in those prisons. There's a lot of physicality, a lot of hurt going on as we read these things in our Bibles. But I want you to think back to what we read earlier on. And I want you to consider what Jesus has done. There in John chapter 16, verse 33, we read a few moments ago. It says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. It's hard to think. How can we find joy in tribulation? How can we find joy in in these trials, especially in what these trials we're reading about. How can we find that joy in any of this? Jesus says, I have overcome the world. The things that we deal with in this life are just momentary. They're just for a little while. Jesus said, don't worry. You're going to face it. We all face difficulty. But be of good cheer. Look forward to what lies ahead. It's difficult to look forward to what lies ahead when we talk about difficulties in our life. When we say that word tribulation, it's hard to find joy. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We have to have that perseverance. That endurance. Because there are things that we face, trials and tribulations, they produce certain things. They produce certain things in our life. You think about what's said over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 down to verse 9. And I have them up here on the board as well. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 down to verse 9. Where it says here, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, looking down to verse 9. It says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Peter knew what was going on. He had been a firsthand experience of these things. If Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me and you're going to scatter. He says here in verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, who, having not seen you love, 
Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your trials, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The trials that we face, the difficulties that we face, produce a genuineness of faith. Though being tested by fire, as we look, fire, to be tested by fire, you get the sense of purity or genuineness of things. You kind of get rid of all the, the extra things. When we face difficulties, we're being that we're facing those trials by fire, so to speak. That if we overcome those things, what does it produce? The salvation of our souls. I, I think about my life. I, I, I share with some of it. Uh, some things that some some things where I am a uh, I, I deal with diabetes now, and I also deal with high blood pressure. It, next, the first of next month, it'll be two years to the date. I took a hospital visit. Uh, I was not feeling well. I was preached Sunday morning and Sunday evening, and did not sleep all night. My son had a doctor's appointment. I took him to his doctor's appointment. And I couldn't, I had just, you know, I'd had different moments throughout the night where I could not breathe. And I thought I was having an asthma attack because I know some of my family has dealt with it before. And I thought, well, maybe that's what's going on with my life. Well, that's what's going on. And I maybe just need to wait. And I was going to wait to go in the morning because I had to take him to his doctor's appointment. So I take Corrigan to his appointment. And I tell Justina, I'm going to go to the, I was originally going to go to the, one of the, the minute clinics or uh, you know, just the quick little clinics. And so, well, if you're dealing with breathing issues, I'm going to tell you to go to, the, go to the hospital. So I go to the hospital, and I get in there, and they put the blood pressure cuff on me, on the one of the automatic ones, and I cannot get a blood pressure reading. Which is, oh, huh, weird. So they tried it, they tried it four or five times. They said, well, maybe we have a faulty machine. You bring in another machine, nothing. So they finally do a, the manual check on me. And my blood pressure was 269 over 170. Just a little high. I also have my, my oxygen reading going on. And my oxygen reading, which is supposed to read certain, I was reading at 48%. And the doctor said, how are you alive? And so they immediately rushed me in to, to start doing the machine. And I, and I get on the phone, I text Justine, I said, well, I might be here for a few more minutes. <laughs> so what's wrong? I said, well, my blood, pre my blood pressure's high. Well, how high is it? So I finally put those numbers in on the phone and said, I'm coming to the, I'm coming to the hospital. I said, no, no, I'm fine. Well, then they said, we're going to give you an EKG, check your heart and everything. Are you okay? I said, no, 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 it's all good. You don't need to come. My oxygen reading is 48%. And they asked me, how are you still alive? I said, I'm coming to the, I said, no. I said, no, it was one of those, uh, I'm coming. And if you don't like it, I don't care. Now, in the meantime as well, I learned uh, a couple hours later, as I was getting ready to finally eat lunch, uh, my sugar levels were, at, I hadn't had anything to eat for the majority of the day, was reading 400 for just my normal sugar level, which, again, a little high. I told I'm diabetic. Well, they, they started to put me on an ins for insulin for just a little bit. I'm not on it anymore now. But I think about all the different things that happened that day. And I drove myself to go take my son to the hospital, or to his doctor's appointment, drove him back to the school, and drove back to the hospital going the same way back across town. And, you know, they said, it's a wonder you didn't pass out or have a heart attack or stroke and sit there and hit a whole bunch of people. And it was this day I was wondering, 
you know, I'm facing some different trials. My, my physical body is apparently facing some rejection and some hurt. But there's a reason why I'm still able to live. There's a reason why I'm not sitting there trying to be revived or suffering or off the road dead because of something. Is it God had a plan for me? I think about the hurt can turn to victory. All the different things that we have faced. You could, I, I, I'm not trying to turn to church. I'm just thinking about my own personal life with this. And how, you know, trying to make some changes, trying to do better with different things, but also understanding I've still got purpose here. I've got a reason why I'm still here alive on this earth, because God has plans for me. And I understand that the hurt, the difficulties, the tribulations that we face are momentary and they can turn into victory. Think about it with me again, where we consider Job. We read in Job chapter 1, chapter 2, of all the difficult tribulations and trials that he was facing. Look with me at the end of Job. In Job 42, verses 12 and 13. If you'll turn, you can turn down your Bibles with me. Job 42, verses 12 and 13. It says here, after all these things that Job faced, and then we see his friends come and try to, his quote-unquote friends try to, trump, try to comfort him. And there were some, some, some choice dealings on that matter. Then Job questioned God. And, you know, God's come to me like a man. The king of that world was to come to me like a man. And we see there all these, all the, uh, the perseverance of Job through all of the things that he went through. It says, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Job faced a lot of difficulties. But at the end of his life, if you're looking at this one. It says that he was blessed more in the end than in the beginning. It says here, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. If you look at the possessions that he had and comparing it to the beginning, I believe almost all those were double. That God, after all these things, Job showing his first God blessed him. We see on the physical side of things. Let's consider the Apostle Paul. Let's look in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. Paul, he's writing to Timothy here. And he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He faced so many different things. Being shipwrecked, being vulnerable, being left out to die, and being you know, humiliated and whipped and beaten and all these different things. And he's getting ready to face his physical death. And he says, I have kept the faith. Verse 8, it says, finally, there is laid up for me the victory, or the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. He knew his life was coming to an end, but he was looking forward to what was lying in store, that victory of the crown of righteousness at the end of the way. We consider our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we look at what he went through. And I want you to look with me in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, or verse 2 in particular, I'm sorry. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, where it says here, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, again, what he went through with the, with the mocking, the beating, the scourging, the dying on the cross, being betrayed by all the different things Jesus endured and went through and gave his life what is it now? Despising the shame, look what it says next. Where is he at? He's at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, willing to give his life, the Son of God, coming from and doing and following through, obeying the Father's will, leaving us an example to follow, is now at the right hand of the throne of God. 
very similar uh, things being spoken of about the brethren in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, where it says here again, we go back there, do not fear any of the other things that you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. We see what they're about to go through. They're going to be going through a lot of dealing, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. They're going to face prison, and they're going to be tested. You're on tribulation ten days. It says, be faithful until death. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Paul was looking forward to the crown, the crown of righteousness that the Lord was going to give. Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God. We see it mentioned again, Christians, again, putting ourselves in this situation, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. We have things we can look forward to. What we're dealing with in this life is momentary when we're looking forward to the things that are eternal. So as we look at this tonight, we ask the question of why do we hurt? It is something that we deal with in life. When I, when Ophelia asked me the question, my daughter, my middle child, when she asked me that question originally, because she was dealing with a lot of difficulties with people picking on her, and she felt like she felt alone there at school. She felt hurt. And when she asked that question, why, Daddy, does life hurt? It's something that was difficult to explain, but then as well, you can't help but also say it's part of life. It, it, it unfortunately is. That we face difficulties. That we're going to face different things in each of our lives. And we're going to face trials. We're going to face suffering. We're going to face hardships. But I also think as well, I know sometimes people will say, well, you know, the, de the devil made me do it sort of thing. The devil is behind the temptation. He's trying to get us to stumble a bit. Temptation is thrown our way. And when we're facing hardship, we're facing tribulation, we're facing suffering, it is a form of temptation. In James chapter 1 and verse, tw uh, verse 12, James chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. It is a form of temptation. You can read verses 13 down to verse 16 as well, even further about where sin comes into play and how it comes through temptation. But the hurt that we're facing is these different pinpoints of trying to cause us to stumble. Again, the devil is trying to cause us to stumble, but it's based upon our own desire. When we're enticed by it, we give in to the different urges, we give in to the different things that cause us to stumble. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, it says, To be sober, to be vigilant, because our adversary of the devil is walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. When we face these difficult times, we are, in a sense, in a vulnerable moment, and Satan is trying to get us to commit sin. He's trying to get us to give in to the urges and temptations of this life, to commit sin. And one of those weak points is when we are dealing with hurt. When we have a sense of loneliness. When we have a sense of there's no one that cares. It is an attempt to try to turn one away from God. That's why we're going through some of the different things. That's why we deal with it. That's why we see pain and suffering. But I want you to think about it tonight as we start drawing this lesson to a close. So I want you to think, how do we remedy all this? Because we, as we read and understand together, we are not alone. As we read earlier in John 16 from our text, is that God loves us. God is there for us. God is looking out for our well-being in all things. 
He says, do be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus has provided a way for us. How do we remedy this knowing that we are not alone? Is that we're to turn to God. There again in James chapter 4 this time, verse 7 and verse 8. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and turn, purify your hearts, you double-minded. We are to submit to God. We're to turn to God. God has provided so many different ways to remedy this. In some of those ways, being able to turn to Him. God has provided friendships for us. Dennis and I were talking just yesterday about this very this very moment. And it's with my dad. And it just so happens. That I, it kind of works out perfect tonight because my dad and Dennis have been close friends. And Dennis has known me. I was three months old almost when, when he first moved to Shaw. So he's known, I can say, he's pretty much known me my whole life. Dennis is not just a friend. I consider them and his and their kids family. And there's a picture that uh, a couple years ago that my dad and Dennis took, and they used Proverbs 1824. There's a friend that sticks close like a brother. They've got that type of friendship. I'm very thankful for it. And I'm feeling the benefits of it. There are people in our life that we can say are our friends that stick close like a brother. And God has provided that. And if you're dealing with hurt, one of those remedies is to be able to use those friends that we have to be able to help us. Those are friends that we want to have close, that we should have sticking close to us. Turn to our friends that we have in this life. Maybe as well, there are family members that we have. It could be, you know, the relationship you have with brother and sister. It could be to your, to your parents. It could be to a cousin, an aunt, an uncle. There is someone that you may have that's within your, your family that you can be able to turn to. But God has provided all of these different methods. We are not alone. God, in fact, as we look, cares for us. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. If you're needing any kind of help, reach out to one another and lean on one another. Maybe there's moments where you might have to use different types of medication. God has provided all of these different ways to not feel alone, to show that he cares and be able to help in all these different scenarios. Use what God has blessed us with and use the tools to help remedy these situations. I want you to think about one more thing with me tonight to draw this lesson to a close. Is that to be able to try to help with this understanding, why do we hurt? We can remedy it because we also know we can look forward to a place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. A place where God is. A place where Jesus is. Revelation 21 verse 4. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. When we think about the pain that we have, we have probably shed many tears in this life. I had a funeral last uh, a week and a half ago. Jelen had passed away there at Batesville, and he was one of seven siblings. And he was 84 years old when he passed away. And there's one brother that is remaining. And right there at the end, I was telling Dennis and Gene about this. I said, you know, there's different things that have happened. Or I've, done, I've, done, I've done several funerals over the years. But I said, this one, this one hit me a little different. Because I've seen tears shed. I've shed tears at funerals as well. But here I am at the close of the service, and this brother comes up, and he just breaks down. He breaks down in tears. And I hear him say, I alone am left. I'm the last one. And tears being shed, the hurt that was going on. And we were talking about it and said, you know, and I use this verse, and I mention it again. said, there's a place that we're looking forward to where there's no more pain, no more sorrow. No more suffering. Jesus went and prepared that place for you and I, and we can look forward 
to no longer being in this world of pain and sorrow, but looking forward to a place of peace. That's what we can look forward to in this life. I want you to go to a land that God has prepared through His Son. I want you to go to a land called Heaven. A land where Jesus has left this world, returned to the Father, and prepared a place for you and I. How do we get to that place? Well, if you're here tonight and you've not yet obeyed the gospel, maybe you're dealing with some difficulties in your life, and you realize tonight that you're ready to look forward to a place where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more crime. If you've not yet obeyed God's word, the invitation is open to you tonight to make your life right with God through hearing the gospel message, believing in Jesus Christ, Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing that belief that Jesus is Lord, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And we're going to face some difficulties in this life. But we must remain faithful. And in turn, we can have the crown of life. If that's your desire, in answering the invitation call this evening, we want to implore and urge with you to make your life right with God. If you have fallen away from God, you face temptation in this life, and you've given in to the temptation leading to sin, we'll be glad to help restore you tonight as you're willing to repent of your sins by confessing Jesus and being able to recognize sin and turning from it and turning back to God. We can pray for you and with you as well. If you are dealing with difficulties in this life, and you're dealing with some temptation, dealing with hurt, and if we can pray for you and encourage you, please don't hesitate. Please reach out to us, and we'll be glad to pray with you to encourage you in any way we can to look forward to that whole promise of life. For the 285 is the invitation song, Zion's Call. It is now. It is available. And if you're ready to answer the invitation call, please come forward all together while we sing and while we sing.